Good everybody, uh, and uh, I think we have all our speakers on the call now. So uh, welcome everyone to the latest meeting of the all-party parliamentary group on forestry and tree planting. Uh, my name is David Lee, and I am just your your host uh, today. Uh, this is our eighth online event uh, since the pandemic changed all our lives, but today is possibly uh, our last online event for now at least. Uh, a little more about uh, future plans later. Uh, but look out for a report on uh, today's event later today on the Comfort website and social media channels. Uh, we will share uh, share that uh, and uh, the, the video of today's meeting with you afterwards. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, there will be time for questions. So if you can please post your questions uh, in the chat box. Uh, if you're not fully familiar with Google Meet, uh, chat box is bottom right, uh, just a little speech bubble. Uh, so if you have any questions for our contributors, uh, pop them in there as, as soon as you possibly can. Uh, and I'll try and bring some of you in to ask those questions. Uh, but without further ado, I shall uh, hand over to the chair of the All Party Group on Forestry and Tree Planting, uh, Ben Lake MP, to uh, welcome us and introduce today's event. Well, from Dan, and thank you, uh, David, uh, for those words of introduction and welcome, everybody. As David said, we've been uh, quite busy um, and had a quite a excellent actually program of events, online events over the last year. Uh, I'm, and I know that today will be no exception to that. Um, we've discussed the England Trees Action Plan regularly, and later we will hear from Caroline Eyre, Confor's National Manager for England, about the next steps in the industry response. Uh, it's vital that the strategy delivers for the UK economy as well as the environment and society. And uh, as we all try to ensure that uh, there's a green recovery, um, that it's not just a, a slogan. Now, before we hear from Caroline, our main discussion today focuses on UK timber and the Palace of Westminster restoration. Uh, those hawk-eyed among you will, will notice that I'm in a different office today because of part of the restoration work at, at Westminster. So I can attest to the fact that it is it is uh, ongoing. The Palace of Westminster, of course, is one of the UK's most iconic buildings, um, but you're probably very much aware that it has been falling apart now for, for quite some years and the restoration is, is uh, well overdue. Um, so the Restoration Renewal Programme, to give its official name, has been set up to lead in a highly complex programme of work needed to protect the Palace's heritage and ensure that it can continue to serve as the home of the UK Parliament through the 21st century and, and well beyond. So where does forestry and wood fit in? Well, most visitors um, are very, very impressed with Westminster Hall, um, with its magnificent hammer beam oak roof was built during the reign of, of Richard II. Um, but wood is actually used extensively across uh, the palace and throughout its buildings, including the House of Commons chamber. So how can UK grown timber be used as part of the programme of works um, at the restoration and renewal project and falls. For an overview of the project, we'll hear from Noah Bold, um, who is Lead Sustainability Manager of the Restoration and Renewal Delivery Authority at the Houses of Parliament. Welcome, Noah. Um, they'll try to answer any questions that you'll, you might have, um, bearing in mind that the project is at an early stage uh, and that today is really about engaging and understanding how the forestry and wood sector can get involved in this quite historic project. Um, so without further words, uh, I shall hand over now uh, over to you, Noah. Thank you for joining us. I think you're on mute. Sorry, Noah. Yeah, good start. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> I will. Uh, I'll come off camera for now while I present my screen, uh, but I will return just to protect my um, bandwidth. So let me know if you can see my I've not used this system before so what can you see can you am I sharing now not yet now no. I'm sorry okay it's uh not letting me share the slides Let's try sharing a window. No. Let's try sharing a tab. Yeah. 
Yeah, I seem to be having trouble sharing my screen. I don't know if Michael or Claire, are you able to share the slides? I I can do that, Noah, if you want. It's uh, Neil Cuthbert here. I, I I got them earlier on. So if you, if you let me do that, and then, um, yeah, we'll do that. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Uh, there we go. Yeah, if you could just scroll up, that'd be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, yeah I'm Noah Bold. I, I lead the Jacob Sustainability Team uh, for the R&R uh, program. Uh, I do have a, a client boss, Omar Rushdie, who can't be with us today. Um, but And as, as Ben said, we are very early on in the program. Uh, and I'm not going to be giving you volumes required or species lists or anything like that. But I'll hopefully give you a, an interesting introduction to the program and some initial thoughts on on how we see our approach to procurement, timber procurement uh, shaping up. So you could just skip to slide two, please. And this is the R and R program vision, and I think it ticks the three boxes there. It recognises that this is a working building, and that we want to encourage uh, visitors. Um, and it's also a, a, a heritage building of enormous uh, significance, not just in the building itself, but also in the events and actions that, that take place there. And, and it's also important to note that the program is, is not just about restoring the Palace of Westminster. It, it's also about finding a temporary home for the House of Lords and, and removing and storing all of the heritage artefacts um, during the renovation. Next slide, please. And just to give you some uh, history and context for the palace, in, in 1836, uh, a public competition was held to find an architect to design uh, the new building. And Parliament's criteria was for a Gothic or Elizabethan style. And the, the eventual winner was the architect Charles Barry, who teamed up with Augustus Pugin, who, who was only 23 at the time, and but who, he designed much of the interior decoration. And the first stone of the new building was laid in 1840. And at that time, construction was estimated to take around six years and cost uh, £725,000, but it ended up taking 30 years at a cost of over two and a half million. And uh, sadly, neither Barry nor Pugin lived to see it finished. Uh, but we all certainly hope to see this programme out. Next slide, please. Yeah, as Ben mentioned, you know, we thought we had to show a picture of Westminster Hall um, to, to, to the attendees here. I mean, it, it, it is fantastic. It was first constructed in 1097. Uh, I think that was before the Hammer Beef room, roof was installed, though. And in, at that time, it was the largest hall in Europe. Uh, the oak Hammer Beef roof was commissioned by Richard II in 1393 and is considered to be the greatest creation of medieval timber architecture and just as will be with our program the materials from around the country were used to construct the hammer beam roof uh, including uh, oak from hampshire hertfordshire uh, and surrey um, and since its construction the hall has obviously played a, a central role in british political life uh, including playing host to the trials of charles i and guy fawkes and uh, hosting speeches from nelson mandela Barack Obama uh, and others. Uh, next slide, please. So the palace is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and this slide gives an idea of the scale of the building. However, I think the bottom statistic is particularly damning, you know, zero compliance step-free entrances, and only one lift that complies with modern safety and accessibility standards. And it just goes to show that this building is, is not really legally compliant to, to modern standards. Uh, next slide, please. And, and, in, and in addition to the considerable accessibility issues, the palace is falling apart faster than it can be repaired, really. Uh, you can see this image of the basement. Um, we have an antiquated uh, heating, ventilation, water, drainage and electrical systems. And there are steam pipes that currently run alongside electrical cables. 
And since 2017, over 40,000 problems have been reported. There's 250 miles of cabling that needs to be replaced. The sewage ejector system <coughs> is, uh, that's still in use today was installed in 1888. And annual spending on maintenance is, is roughly 120 million pounds a year. And the, the longer the essential work is left, um, well, the greater risk of failure, uh, as we saw with Notre Dame. And to mitigate the risk of, of fires happening at the palace, fire wardens patrol the building 24 hours a day. So that's the task. That's why we're here. Uh, next slide, please. And just to give you some detail on our program structure, um, we're governed uh, by a two-tier structure, similar to the London 2012 Olympics and other uh, successful infrastructure projects. Um, the sponsor body on the left is, is a single client accountable to the parliament, and the, the sponsor body will set the strategic direction of the programme, and they will prepare the outline business case, which was a detailed and costed uh, restor restoration and renewal plan, which is due to be completed towards the end of next year. And the delivery authority on the right, uh, they're responsible for the design and delivery of the works and uh, they are ultimately accountable to the sponsor body. Next slide, please. And this is the story so far, where we've got to so far. Uh, and I think the most interesting aspect here are the results of the strategic review down at the bottom. And the review is carried out to test whether anything had changed so significantly over the years as to as to warrant a change in, in approach. And uh, the review um, uh, found that Richmond House should remain the location where the MPs are housed and that the <coughs> QE2 conference centre uh, should uh, remain uh, where the Lords uh, intend to be re relocated. Um, and as for where we are in the programme, we're, we're midway through Reba Stage 2 concept design. So we've not started looking at specifying the type or quantity of materials in detail at this stage. Uh, that kind of information will come in, in Reba 3, which, uh, which I believe will commence after uh, the business case is, is issued. Uh, next slide, please. And we're, we are committed to informing and listening uh, to the public views. Um, we have started engaging with the public to, to get their views on the restoration of the building. And from the initial feedback, we know that a high percentage of people uh, think that restoration is important um, and that we should also reduce energy demand and that we should be investing in, in apprenticeships amongst many other things. But I think what's really telling from the public engagement we've had so far is that sustainability is, is, is really kind of high up on the agenda. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So drawing the discussion more towards uh, sustainability, and as shown here, uh, we have six strategic themes for r, &R and they cover uh, design, uh, accessibility, uh, history, <clears throat> sustainability, uh, value for money, and uh, health and safety. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and when we break these strategic themes down, into their respective goals. We see that sustainability is, <clears throat> is oh, excuse me, frog in my throat. We see that sustainability is embedded within each of the strategic themes of the program. And that's demonstrated by the purple borders around uh, some of these goals. And that uh, shows that we're going, sustainability on the program goes well beyond the strategic sustainability st strategic theme itself. Uh, for example, in functionality and design, we want to we want to deliver operational efficiency and longevity, but we also want to provide sustainable logistic solutions that support um, modern methods of, of construction. Um, looking at heritage and the sense of history, uh, we acknowledge that the significance of the heritage of the building but we also want to embrace the opportunity for change and uh, flexibility. And under <clears throat> time and value for money, we want to look at whole life costing, uh, uh, optimizing the operating 
uh, capital costs, but also looking at things like whole life, whole life carbon costs as well. Next slide, please. Mm, okay. And uh, to support the sustainability ambitions of the program, we have a suite of sustainability policies uh, that are on our website and uh, they're publicly available. <clears throat> and they cover the topics uh, shown here. Um, biodiversity, that's protecting the existing natural habitats and biodiversity and where possible increasing biodiversity on the estate. Uh, carbon, which we'll look at enabling the parliamentary estate or supporting the parliamentary estate in becoming net zero carbon through energy reductions and uh, renewable energy sources. Uh, circular economy uh, will help us embed circular economy principles on the programme. Uh, skills and apprenticeships, uh, creating high quality employment skills and training. Uh, social value, um, maximising social value for the programme and creating and sharing benefits across the UK and not just in London. And sustainable procurement. <clears throat> and that, that one's greyed out because the key considerations of that have been included within the main procurement policy. But we want to ensure that uh, fair procurement processes are in place and that we uh, uh, source sustainably. We'll also be writing an outward facing program sustainability strategy over the next year or so. And um, it's the intention that our policies and strategy will help us deliver on issues such as uh, sustainable timber procurement. Uh, next slide, please. So let's let's start with you know, why we feel start with why we feel timber procurement is important on R and R. And I've researched a couple of views here, uh, starting with the Timber Trade Federation, who highlight um, quite rightly that timber is an inherently sustainable construction material, and sustainable timber procurement will be key to the fight against climate change. And uh, another view from WWF uh, who highlight that irresponsible demand for timber and mismanagement in the supply chain can neg negatively impact forest conservation, which will have knock-on impacts for fighting climate change. And reducing our demand for virgin materials on the R&R programme is a key part of our, of our circular economy ambitions. Uh, next slide, please. There's also the um, reputational risk that comes with working on such a high, high profile project such as this one. And if we do not procure legal and sustainable timber, then we will get found out, uh, as has happened to Parliament before, uh, as these articles demonstrate. Um, I think the incident on the right saw Greenpeace draping banners from cranes, um, highlighting unsustainable timber procurement to the world. Um, Thankfully, I mean, they're quite old articles now, but it just goes to show it is a newsworthy event if we get it wrong. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but I mean, we do have experience of managing this on other major programmes. Um, I, among others who work on the programme, uh, worked on construction of the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games venues and uh, managed I managed timber procurement there where 100% of the timber used is certified legal and sustainable. And at the time we worked under UK government procurement rules, which meant we had to ensure we were not favoring one certification body over another. Uh, hence the need for joint certification to the FSC and PESC standards. And, and this was the first time that these certification bodies had worked together. And I remember the initial meetings were very secretive. <coughs> Uh, but they recognised the, the significance of the of the Olympic program and, and were willing to jointly certify us. Uh, and it was also the largest construction project in the world to ever achieve certification. <clears throat> and the key to our success was was the creation of a timber supplier panel. That's my view, anyway. <laughs> this this was a group of sixteen timber suppliers that were contractually required to only supply legal and sustainable timber to the contractors. And this this put the onus on the supplier rather than procurer, rather than the procurer, because if non-certified timber was supplied, 
then we would have removed that supplier from the panel with all of the reputational issues that that would have carried. And, and thankfully, uh, we didn't have to do that. And you may have seen recently that Tokyo 2020 was criticized for using illegally sourced plywood during construction of their game. So, so I'm very proud of the measures we put in place uh, for London. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so, so back in back in 2012, the focus was very much on procurement and so procuring sustainably. But you know, now we're 10 years on, sustainability has evolved, <clears throat> and restoration is the focus for us on our program. And we will be taking a much more um, circular approach to resource use, uh, starting with repairing and restoring the existing timber where possible and the image you see on the left is of uh, Westminster Hall roof lantern uh, where the timber was salvaged and retained um, we would then aim to procure reclaimed or recycled timber where possible uh, and through the uh, intended extensive engagement with with various heritage organizations throughout the country perhaps there will be opportunities to use timber um, that's been used in in buildings from a similar era and then, of course, when we do not have to buy, when we well, when we do have to buy new, we will be aiming for locally produced certified timber. And, and when we say locally, we mean timber that has been grown in the UK. But we, we also recognise that, um, according to Horace Historic England, that the pine forests of the Baltic were sourced as an alternative supply for expensive oak, uh, and uh, and that. That pine can be found in most historic buildings that date from 1750 to 1900, but I'm sure we'll be able to source UK grown pine if needed. And we would certainly intend to engage with uh, Grown in Britain and the wider timber supplier industry, um, people like yourselves, through, through market engagement uh, when we get a bit further along with the design phase um, and we're preparing for, 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 for the procurement phase. Um, next slide, please. And then, and then finally, just to end on this slide, we're, we're currently developing our strategic approach to carbon reduction. And part of this strategy will no doubt involve an element of offsetting our carbon. And we're engaging with, with relevant groups on appropriate offsetting routes. And, and we absolutely would want to invest in projects that that uh, physically remove carbon from the air, such as uh, reforestation and the prevention of deforestation or, or afforestation, uh, which is the planting of trees in areas where they may where there may not have been forest before. Um, however, we, we also recognise that the planting of new forests can put uh, global food security at risk, and it may be better to look at techniques such as agroforestry, um, which is the the practice of combining crop cultivation or pasture with growing trees as this would uh, this would allow people to use the land for food whilst sequestering carbon at the same time but it, it's very early days into our research into this field <clears throat> but we would hope to share more in the next year or so as well as carry out further engagement with the timber industry once the design is further developed on on issues such as timber restoration um, timber products that meet our circular um, economy ambitions and in procuring sustainable timber uh, within a heritage context. Um, yeah, so as mentioned, we're still in the early stages of the program, but we are we are interested in hearing your thoughts on what you believe the challenges we face uh, uh, might be and whether there is anything beyond that, which uh, I have presented uh, so far that we should be considering uh, at this stage. Thank you very much. You can stop sharing now. Thanks. Um, thanks very much indeed, uh, Noah. Um, I just wonder, first of all, um, while understanding this is not entirely clear yet, but in terms of that specification of materials and the procurement process, is there a rough is there a rough timeline in place? Um, so we're in the middle of Reba two now. Uh, Reba two will continue uh, into next year. Um, and uh, as, as I said, the outline business case will should be issued at the end of 2022. Um, 
and, and then it will go to MPs to debate uh, the options um, and, uh, and an option will be selected. And then we will move into REBA 3 at some point in, in 2023. I'm not sure how long uh, the MPs need to debate that. Claire may be able to uh, step in. But uh, uh, so then uh, during REBA 3, uh, we'll have an option that we'll be able to focus on. And then we'll be looking at specifications of, of materials, we'll be looking at volumes, and then we'll, we'll be engaging uh, more deeply with the market um, uh, on, on those uh, supply routes and uh, suitable supply chains and things like that. So probably around 2023, but I don't know if Claire or Michael, you want to add to that. I think that's probably about as much um, specificity as we can give at this point. As Noah said, laid out the timeline like that. The voting, we're hoping early 2023 um, in the houses will be the, the big point, but it will be up to the houses to decide exactly when that's scheduled. Um, so we're dependent on that. Okay. Um, Lord Colgrave, you've raised your hand. Would you like to come in and make a comment at this stage? I have, if I could. I don't want to digress too much. I think Noah's given an extremely good um, presentation. But I'm actually a member of the Finance Committee in the Lords, and we've been working very closely uh, alongside the R&R team. We're dealing with the day-to-day -day problems now, rather than obviously the, the issues of R&R &R, uh, in the years to come. But just to add a little bit more detail to what Noah said, uh, I mean, it's quite interesting that with regard to the existing building, there are actually no plans that show where uh, some of the problem areas lie. Uh, and by, by way of example, um, it is known that there's asbestos in the building, but it is not known how much asbestos there is, nor indeed where it's located. Uh, and another example of the difficulties, when the bell tower was taken off the top of Westminster Hall to be repaired, it was discovered that it had been damaged by a bomb uh, during the last war and that in fact the entire structure was twisted so what should have been a very straightforward job and a job that had been fairly tightly budgeted became an extremely complicated job which which way exceeded its budget and i think it's just sort of interesting to show how uh, historic buildings of this sort uh, present fairly unique difficulties but just to come back to the point and the woodland point i wonder if i could um leave Noah with the suggestion that when it comes to sourcing um, oak timber in particular, if there's going to be a requirement to replace some of the trusses in Westminster Hall, um, and again, having been up uh, underneath the eaves of the hall when it was being repaired last year, I was surprised to find that actually the Victorians have put quite a lot of metal stays across the top, because a number of the replacements that have been done previously were with wood which has begun to perish and the strength isn't really there um, but when the 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 um, timber comes to be replaced and if it's replaced with oak is there merit uh, in exploring what happened with the globe theater when um, uk landowners were asked to donate timber because it was a building that was going to be of such importance to the nation and my own view is that there would be great willingness to do this if it was if it was phrased and couched in the right way. And this might be a considerable cost saving and heaven knows we're going to be doing everything we possibly can to contain the costs, uh, as well as having a sort of you know sense of national importance that could be attached to it. And maybe it's something that you could factor in at some point. Thank you. Absolutely. And I, I think the R&R &R programme would support that. Um, and I think it, it's in line with our, our social value aspirations and that whole discussion around spreading the benefits of the programme uh, throughout the UK. And we, we don't just want this to be a London centric programme. We want all of the nations and regions to be able to uh, have a have a stake in it. So I think that would be an excellent way of doing that. OK, thank, thanks very much. Uh, and thank, thanks, Lord Colgrain, for your comments there. And uh, if anybody else wishes to raise the hand or, or just put your name into the chat box and you'd like to come in uh, and, uh, and, and ask Noah or any of the other team any questions. Uh, there was a, a pre-posed question uh, from Fenning Wellstead uh, from Goldcrest saying that much of the timber in the Palace of Westminster at the moment is hardwood. And is there any indication of whether or not we have sufficient homegrown supply of the right quality or is it is it too early to address that question, Noah? Yeah, I, th I think it's too early to know what we need. But I, I love the idea of, of having that uh, 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 
of the, the fact that people are, are keen to know at this stage how much we're going to know. I think it re it's really exciting that this program is generating uh, those kind of questions and uh, uh, and inquiries and, and long may that continue. But I think at this stage, it's a bit early to know. Um, but I, I, I guess it's also a question uh, for you guys that, because I think a lot of our, I think that we want to promote UK grown timber. And, and I guess to bounce that question back is, is the UK timber industry mature enough to be able to supply what we're going to need? And I guess, I guess we'll, that question can be answered over time, but uh, I guess uh, at the moment is the UK timber industry in a healthy, in a healthy position? I guess that's my question back to you. We'll, we'll, we'll bring in Caroline, if I can be slightly facetious first, and say <laughs> I, know these, I know that these projects do tend to take it, you know, they do tend to run over time, as you pointed out, the last one in the 19th century went rather over time. Uh, however, there's probably not much time to grow much oak in the meantime. So Caroline, have we got, you know, how, what do you think, how we, how we doing in terms of a kind of strategic supply of hardwoods at the moment? What, what have we got out there? Well, interestingly, um, Tony Willis, who's actually on this call, sent me a, a picture of a plaque and it says the greatest timber framed roof in Europe the massive carved Ooh. frames for the roof of the Great Hall in the Palace of Westminster were made in Farnham not far from this spot and sent to London in the summer of 1395. Now back in 1395 I suspect we had a far greater timber reserve than we do now and we didn't have the um, the grey squirrel which is the the other the dirge of uh, broadleaf hardwood timber growers and probably a very well um, managed deer population. But it's a very good question. Um, and actually, I'm going to divert to the discussion later and those on this call, whether or not they think that we have a significant uh, reserve of timber to supply what I suspect will have to be quality timber into into the renovation. Uh, we've also got HMS Victory, I believe, being renovated at the moment. They've just gone through their birthing um, uh, procedure and secured the ship and we're going into to tendering for the timbers now. I don't have the results of that, but perhaps that could be another call. But I am actually going to revert to to members after after i've given a very very short presentation because I, I am interested in what questions are on on the um the future england forest and wood-based industries leadership group Caroline, <laughs> Caroline, can, we, can we come back can we come back to that in a minute we've got a yeah. couple of people who have raised their hands already we'll yeah, come no to that in a minute. so we've got we've got danis and then jez have asked yeah. to come in so danis if you want to come in first uh and 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 put your comment or question Hi. Um, yeah, the question was asked whether or not there was a big enough hardwood resource in Britain. I, I, I bet Caroline would agree with me that there might well be quite a large um, uh, broadleaf forest resource in, in the UK, but most of it is unmanaged. So you won't have the correct grade of timber to use in such a prestigious project. And um, you're more likely to find high-grade softwoods than you are to find high-grade hardwoods in Britain for very simple um, historical reasons. We overused it in shipbuilding. Um, then we had to go to uh, the Baltic states and other places to get our oak. So um, a lot of London is built with uh, Baltic timber or Nordic timber. Um, so <laughs> you, you may have to... Um, think in a different way if you really want to use homegrown resources in this project. Perhaps even think about um, initiating glue land manufacture at some scale, in, in certainly in England. Um, but anyway, um, Wood Knowledge Wales would be really happy to work with you. Um, we work alongside um, Confor quite often. And um, yeah, we can help you on this. Thank you. OK, thanks, Danish. Jez, do you want to come in and add some comments? Hi, yes. Um, I suppose I was just going to, Caroline, sort of be me turned in a way. If you haven't yeah. spoken to HMS Victory yet, it might be worth it because they've been looking at the sort of ethical materiality decisions around uh, conservation of significant historic artefacts. And they're looking at using modern techniques in laminating to be able to retain the use of UK timber. And the other thing they're doing is about soon to be appointing um, 
an independent go-between, I guess, between timber suppliers, a timber expert, to go between suppliers and themselves to ease that process. But if you haven't spoken to them, definitely worth it. Thank you. Great advice. Thank you. And what's your What's your assessment, Jez, of what of what there is out there from you know from your own movements in the in the southwest and beyond? I think I, I'd probably agree with Danis quite strongly. It, to To use solid timber might be quite difficult. Might be possible. It's difficult to know without volumes. But bringing modern technology and laminating and finger jointing in will certainly make it a lot more possible to do something, and actually sort of moves forward the evolution of timber within a historic structure which is quite compelling as well to mix traditional and modern crafts within the building yeah okay thanks jez uh tom barnes i'll bring bring you in now tom hi there um just just a couple of comments um we're talking about various projects it's also worth looking at the recent upgrades to the Tower of London undertaken by the Royal Palaces, um, because unusually they set about that project with the very clear aim that they were going to use British timber and British oak. And it wasn't a case of, of what, um, what normally happens with these projects is that it's specified and it's left very open. And then it goes out to contractors who are in a tearing rush and trying to do it as cheaply as possible. And if the British oak isn't of the grade that's been specified or instantly available, it's just swept aside and they go and buy whatever they can find. If you want to use volumes of hardwood grown in this country, particularly oak, you need years of notice to make that happen. So the question of whether the wood is available, if you go out with a few months notice, 100% not. If you go out with a few years notice of knowing what you need roughly and start accumulating you've got half a chance but I would also make the point that you know if we're talking about oak whichever country you're going to get it from the grade of oak is reducing all the time and and has actually reduced quite dramatically over the last few years so one thing I would really ask is that we don't over specify this job because the sort of scourge of oak framing in my experience is that it's massively overspecified these days um you know more so on aesthetics than anything structural so if we want to use british timber throughout whether this is large lumps of oak um, structural oak or uh, wood for joinery and we genuinely want to try and use locally grown wood then we have to specify accordingly and that's in terms of um you know in terms of the specification and the grade so let's not ask for everything to be prime plastic hardwood. Let's actually consider allowing a few defects, allowing a few knots in the timber. And then you've got far more chance, whether it's softwood or hardwood, you've got far more chance of using timber grown in this country. Yeah, and Thank Tom, you. Tom, you've commented previously at APG meetings about that whole hardwood culture in the mm. UK, which is obviously, as you say, it's not necessarily it's not going to be in time for this project but it is something we need to get get together could you just explain to Noah and the others from the team just a tiny bit quickly about your business and about that hardwood sawmilling culture and how that's kind of declined yeah well, no our, our business is is cutting up British hardwoods and softwoods so we're a sawmilling company and um, you know this is what we do we are our job is to permanently go and source logs grown in this country and then cut it into products that that we can sell um, and it is you know it's it's difficult we don't have a huge amount of timber in this country I mean the the, the recent price increases which are, are you know even as we speak at the moment oak log prices across Europe have jumped up 30 percent in the last few months um, so wood is coming to market more more so than than ever but just to give you an indication um you know we, we would have not long from now the forestry commission auction which is traditionally where hardwood parcels are auctioned they're as far as i hear they're not going to have it this year because there's nothing to auction uh because it's it's either all come to market because of the wood value um and there just isn't there isn't that much there so you know what the, the broad question can we do it 
the answer is we don't have the faintest idea till we know what's needed. But certainly the only way it's going to be possible is with warning and enough time. I mean, in terms of, of the woodland culture, I mean, that's, that's all about having an understanding of forestry and, uh, and of the use of timber and of the connection between the two. And this comes back to specification because, you know, if you treat wood as a as a, an animal object you know there's got to be a certain color and a certain grade and, and a certain price then the chances are we're not going to end up getting it from this country but if we actually treat it as a project where we explore the supply chain explore forestry issues and explore what's possible and you know jez was saying there about maybe bringing in a bit of technology well let you know let's rather than starting from the I need a piece of prime plastic oak. Where can I get it from? Let's look at what we've got here and how we might be able to utilize that in the palace. Because, you know, going back to when it was first constructed and when buildings were constructed hundreds of years ago, they started from the point of view of, of what have we got and then how can we use that? And that's why if you go into old oak frames, you've got, you know, literally bent branches up there in all manner of shapes and sizes, because that's what they had. And in this part of the world, it would have been elm, it might have been a bit of ash, it might have been a bit of chestnut, a bit of oak, because that's what was there. Mm -hmm. So I would kind of urge you, and I know that there are limits to what, you know, we can do these days in terms of design, and there are requirements now that weren't in existence back then. But let's, you know, let's, I would like to see us genuinely try to use local material for this building because it would be, in my view, it would be a crime if we didn't. Mm. But to do that, we have to we have to sort of start very early and really look at what's possible and the sort of grade species specifications that are possible. And it might be then that a, a you know a proportion ends up coming from this country and a proportion ends up being imported. But at least at the end of it, we can all say we tried. Thank you. Really, really important and useful points there uh, tom thank thanks very much tom uh tim roland uh you put a, a message in the chat tim do you want to come in uh yeah hello can you hear me yeah we can hear you tim yep hi uh, um yeah i've just a, a quick plug for um the charity that i'm the chief executive of future trees trust who for for 30 years now have been selectively breeding broadleaf trees as i've said in my comments specifically to address this issue um, uh, we've identified that there's just not going to be enough good quality hardwood timber to restore these buildings when they burn down, as they invariably will, or or um, or, or uh, to restore places like the Palace of Westminster. So yeah, please check out futuretreestrust.org and find out about our work. Okay, thanks, um, Caroline. I'm just going to come back to you before we go on to the other bit of the meeting. And um, there was. Uh, question comment from Edward Wilson which touches on some of the points we've made already about this natural strategic reserve for conservation projects in 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 the long term um and we don't know really what we've got and if something like Notre Dame does happen uh, we wouldn't necessarily have the native timbers available for the reconstruction effort do we need to understanding that this is a very long term approach but do we do we need to do that caroline Right. Absolutely. And I say I agree with that. And that's why I wanted members to come in and, and speak from their you know, their experience. The, you know, the guys on this call are the practitioners. Um, we, we, we had a timber reserve in 1919 when the Forestry Commission was set up. It was set up to, uh, to bring back a timber reserve after the World Wars. But what was predominantly planted, of course, was softwood because it's faster growing, it was cheaper to do that at the time. And that's really where the knowledge over the last, you know, decades has come from is, is softwood um, growing and also softwood processing as well. So as Tom says, there's very few hardwood mills now and particularly small family hardwood mills. But the, you know, we need to invest. We need to invest not in, in just in skills, but in, in knowledge and future trees just do that into building up a timber reserve. But that will take hundreds of years, not just decades. And to do that, we have the issues of, of pest management. We also have say 60% of our hardwood um, broadleaf resource in, in England is unmanaged because of past public policy. We have all of that to address and hopefully, yes, we can move forward. And I do really hope that the Palace of Westminster can use at least some local timber and really promote that. And before we move on, Caroline, I think what we can say after today is that there is a 
very very clear willingness and and a, and a very open door from from Comfor and the industry Absolutely. to bring together some of the the expertise that we've got uh, among the membership and beyond with other organisations as well to actually work uh, with the restoration and renewal team uh, to actually support you know in any way that we can uh, to to as Tom describes to make those decisions on what's actually practical and what can be done with what we've got rather than doing that over specification so we'll we'll you know we'll we'll make, we'll make that you, you can make that commitment on behalf of Comfort Caroline that the door is open and Comfort and others will get involved as much as they possibly can I think it's our duty to do so absolutely yes yeah okay um and thank you thank you very much and if anybody has got any other questions uh that we we don't have time to raise now please uh send them to Neil as the organizer of this meeting and we'll 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 pass them on um, but just also, which I hope is again helpful context uh, for uh, the Royal Forestry Society door is open too, says Jen Turner. That's fine. Everybody's 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 wooden door is open. Um, so Caroline, if again, I think this is helpful for the project more broadly, just to see where the industry is at the moment. We had the England Trees Action Plan in May. Um, industry really wants to get involved in that trees action plan uh, and you you're just here to give the appg an update on where those discussions with the industry and defra have gone so yeah. uh, over to you for part two then absolutely it'll be a joint effort to uh, all come together as we should do within the industry all, all different bodies all different interests in the industry i it's a very short update david because we are literally at the point of uh, organizing our first meeting but the England Trees Action Plan, as we all know, was, was launched and within that there were hooks for the timber industry. We are now in a process of sort of mapping that, not sort of, but we are going to map the, the, the action plan and set up, <laughs> I don't think there's an acronym for it, but the England Forest and Wood-Based Industries Industry Leadership Group. So, um, you know, ideas on the back of a postcard of how, how we shorten that, but um, it will have a remit of being a forum for discussion, specifically discussing and putting forward challenges, uh, but opportunities for the for forest and wood-based industries in, in England, articulating the needs of the English industry and what the, the English industry can deliver for government, um, working very much with, with UK government and, um, and, the, and the public sector as well, so it's not just private sector. It's received unanimous support from uh, all we've just we've all the people we've discussed it to date, including Lord Goldsmith, senior DEF officials who are developing a timber policy roadmap alongside the green um, construction industry. I think that's right. But the plan that we will be looking at, the industry plan that that, that this group will be looking at, will be wider than just construction. It will be for all markets de developing the English industry. So not just construction. Um, we have a terms of reference, draft terms of reference uh, that will hopefully be agreed by the group when it meets at the end of October. But uh, quite a few of you on this call are going to be part of that group. It's not just for Comfort members, it is for those that bring the experience and the knowledge of the supply chain, whether members or not. Uh, and we will report after our first meeting. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Caroline. I just wonder if just pulling the, the two strands together a little bit, this is specifically a, a, an English industry leadership group, which and th there is an industry leadership group in Scotland, uh, which, um, you know, again, for the benefit of the restoration renewal team, is much more well developed in terms of its industry, particularly based around softwoods. But presumably, there will be quite a need in the House of Commons project for uh, you know, basic joinery, and there will be need for softwoods to be used in there as well. Uh, and we do have a growing softwood resource in in Scotland and in other parts of the UK, uh, which also should be part of this discussion, Caroline. Yeah. Yeah. We also, uh, yeah, and Dennis is on call. We also have a, a Wales industry group as well. So we'll be working with both Scotland and Wales to um, to look at that. Uh, but yes, absolutely. It's about. In, it's inc about increasing the England industry, hardwood and softwood. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, okay. Um, if anybody's got any final points, uh, anything to put to Caroline, just please pop them um, uh, into the box. As I say, we'll take anything away that we've got that isn't isn't sort of raised. Uh, I'd just like to say, you know, thank you, thank you to Caroline, and thank you to all the members who've who've added comments in there. 
Uh, and on behalf of the APPG and and the wider industry, um, you know, the very much kind of uh, open door, reaching out to do anything that the industry can to kind of support this 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 project. And as Caroline said, there is a duty a duty of the industry to kind of get involved and really engage in any way we can. So we'll talk about how we can do that uh, after this meeting and and come back to you. Um, we uh i'm going to finish up slightly early i know everybody's time is precious i'm going to hand back to ben um for some uh, exciting news we've talked about having uh, eight online events over the last year uh but ben a little bit of an update on what comes next thank you uh david and thanks also very quickly to, to noah and caroline for yet another successful online meeting but as david has alluded to we've got some exciting news for you all uh, we are planning an in-person event uh, fairly soon. In fact, on the 2nd of November, which is a Tuesday, uh, to be held in the Churchill Room in the Houses of Parliament. Um, it'll be an afternoon event between four and six o'clock, um, hosted by the APPG, um, and we'll be serving you with afternoon tea and also offering the opportunity for people to catch up once again and to relaunch in-person meetings of this group formally. Um, we'll get a chance to enjoy some afternoon tea and hopefully some good conversation before we have a short um, update on a range of issues, the England Trees Action Plan, uh, the EFRA Tree Planting Inquiry, and other important issues. There'll then be some time for further conversation, and I really hope you'll be able to join us. So if I could ask you to save the date for now, it's the so four, four to six o'clock on Tuesday, November the 2nd, um, and you'll receive further details uh, in, the, in the very short future. Um, now, I very much look forward to meeting many of you in person for the first time. Um, it's quite, it feels a bit bizarre to say that, but it, for many of you, it will be the first time uh, to meet you in person. Um, and just thank you again for attending this afternoon's online event and to Noah and Caroline and to Confo uh, for the excellent organisation uh, once again. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks very much, Ben, and we hope to see uh, see many of you on the second of November, uh, uh, and have a good have a good rest of the day. And and uh, thanks to all the R and R team for taking part today, and uh, thanks to Ben for taking part in all these online meetings. And yeah, I look forward to look forward to meeting you for the first time, Ben, and seeing if you're as as young as you actually look on screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cheers, everybody. Thank all you. the best. Thank you, Thank you, David. Bye. 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 Bye